So, thank you. I uh, hope you can all hear me. This brings us to the panel discussion section of this evening's entertainment, um, and we will all stop talking uh, relatively soon. So, I'm trying to clear the ideas with my six year old child when I pick him up from school. Not that I'm saying you guys need to treat like children, but um, it works really well. So, I wanted to ask the three panelists, and I'm joined by Dr. Jack Barton, who actually, I think we should give a big round of applause yes. for this gentleman. <laughs> yeah, hybrid events are super difficult. Um, it gave, gives me some sort of anxiety, like for heart attack. Um, but, you know, it's, been, it's just been done so well, so thank you. And obviously, also joined, um, who I just pulled onto the panel real quick there, um, Dr. Lucio Lucio, whose name I'm just going to keep pronouncing all that. So I get it right. And uh, we're all from the School of Field Environment, and um, last but by no means least, Dr. Kate Dunn, um, also from the School of Field Environment um, and the Interior Architecture Program, and Dr. Jeff Barton is from D, let me see if we can get this right, Geospatial Research Innovation Development Group. That's it? Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, so the thing I wanted to ask you guys, and anyone can start the first, this is my six year old. Question trick is what is the most interesting thing that you learned from the presentations today that has stuck with you? Ha! Oh, yeah, that was deliberate. That was really, that was really Yeah, wrap it in the headlights. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I really liked um, the, the, the concept of, of entropy and being able to capture that at, at different points in time and the, the value of that and how, how things will change, things will evolve, and how can we um, give them a longer life and fight against that force. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to uh, Dr. Kelly and whose name I'm probably going to get wrong. First, you have the Green up. Green up. Oh, it's for the it's for the stream. Oh, yeah. um, I think that in there, I was the way you should have to the heritage and the ability to do all the heritage and the museum for the scale. But once you move to the scale of the building and that it's spatial experience and how that translates and um, I think those questions are really interesting ones to raise. But I feel like that's more of a I want to keep you know experiencing that and thinking about that. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is sort of sort of what happened. Yeah. Um, I I was definitely um, surprised um, during the keynote um, to to see uh, you know this uh, role of um, in how the focus of building and heritage could also. Uh, be related to the intangible. Mm -hmm. um, so something that, you know, every now and then is something that you have in your mind and then there's someone else that, that it's framed that so beautifully. And I thought, yeah, that's a, that's a clear one probably of the takeaway of uh, today's. And the beautiful archive uh, that you guys uh, digitalize and analyze directly, I think, I mean, Unfortunately, for the people that are online that cannot appreciate that, but this exhibition is wonderful, and there is, you know, the, the creation, the level of detail of this model, it's really, uh, it's really impressive, and 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 I have the overall from all the speakers the feelings that, you know, this is just the first stone towards, yeah. you know, framing and, and giving like a you know robust methodology and so on towards for this digital heritage approach, so it's quite exciting, yeah. Thank you. And what I really want to say is actually coming back to the intangible aspects of what we're talking about here, the intangible heritage, because this really fascinates me. And you spoke to it right during your presentation, and at the end you talked a little bit about how when you reproduce, you learn about the processes and you discover things. And I know Daniel here, who produced our parametric models, learned a lot about the Amuni Dome. And there was a particular junction in there that was really you know, um, difficult to resolve. And I think those things really um, come to light through the doing. 
And Kate, I wonder if you can talk about that from the perspective of 3D fabrication. Yeah, um, I guess. Yeah, um, I guess one thing I find a lot in working with architecture students and um, designers is the the barriers between the virtual and the real, and and then the physical effects of gravity, of uh, materiality, of plasticity, um, heat, the environmental conditions, and how when we make things in that we see on the screen and then we make them actually suppose it's more to engineering than anything. Um, when we make them in in the world where things get let down. So I'm I'm interested to see those those exchanges keep happening and I I sort of look forward to seeing when the virtual and the physical become interchangeable. I'm not sure it's there yet, but I I think it will happen because if you look at these models, I saw the original models when I was in um, Japan, and they were all handmade. Every single tiny little strut was handmade out of bamboo, either the delicacy of someone's hand being able to do that, and then the workload between Daniel and Charlotte parametrically modeling these, and then they just came back. And made in a powder printer and just manifest. It's quite, it's almost like there's still a huge workload, but it's a very different type of workload. It's very hidden, isn't it? Yeah, everyone's like, oh yeah, we can just 3D print that straight out of the printer. How oh. hard can it be? Yeah, you can just press a button. It's really hard. What, what were the actual materials? What's the, the composition? Uh, so the materials, we did a lot of research um, into the best way to fabricate these. And it turns out the person sitting by hand is probably still the best. Not really. Because uh, <laughs> we have the option for repetition. But it's really time consuming to model these. I know that um, Charlotte and Daniel spent days making these. And so it's it's still a really interesting question. These are um, laser sintered in a powder printer, and the material is a, it's a type of nylon. Um, and we were talking about uh, colouring these and whether we're going to colour them or not. They also have uh, glass embedded in the nylon to give it that kind of structural integrity. But uh, what's interesting is the material, the how far it moves away from the timber that uh, Shoyo was considering. So I, I find these really beautiful, but I don't find them the same as seeing the original models. I feel like they're another iteration. Yeah, interpretation. Yeah. And as well, it's lovely to see the student work down there as well. Yeah. How, how the students have interpreted it. Yeah, again, to do And I think, I mean, if it's not obvious from how the exhibition is presented, we focused on, um, I guess, the construction processes. Um, because this really, this exhibition, these three, particularly the middle three buildings, do tell a story of a construction process that spans across those buildings because in order to produce a unique dome, um, you need to undertake tests uh, to have the uh, certification of the joints in the space frame, to the space frame system. Um, so definitely a focus, I think, here on tangible um, mm -hmm. cultural heritage and, and how we might how we might start it, I guess. And communicate that internationally yeah. through a period of COVID, which yeah. was yeah. quite a, 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 a bizarre context for the project. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to move on to uh, our future, because the title of this panel discussion was What is the Future of Past? And I'll give you a little bit of a 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 bit of how do you see technology such as 3D scanning and digital fabrication being applied to innovate architectural heritage and cultural preservation going forward? What's the next big thing? I'm going to hand it to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where I got my lapel mic here. Um, but um, the, um, well, what can you imagine? And I think a lot of what we can imagine we can achieve using the flexibility of these tools. Um, certainly though we're going to get in, um, much you know vastly improved accuracy and speed and um, uh, efficiency in you know cheaper 
ways of doing, more accessible ways of doing things. Um, and that's where I think there's been just huge leaps and bounds. I mean, we couldn't imagine, you know, being able to make something like that out of a computer as you'd hit print, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and so uh, I think it has been well done. These technologies have been well directed by you know, creative minds and different architects and designers and, and, and uh, engineers, you know. And um, uh, it, it's what's the next big thing? Well, I guess we get back to those big issues of sustainability and livability and good spaces for human activity, which I think Shoei Go also really nailed, you know, like uh, what was and proves that he was way ahead of his time. So. Big thing I, I do, but I don't know if that happened. It's around the user interface of new technologies because a lot of the people in this room are highly specialised, highly trained with new technologies. And I think the thing to me that will be the next step is not necessarily the technology, but the, the accessibility of the technology to everyday people, like your iPhone. The fact that everybody, or well, sorry, I shouldn't judge other people who don't have that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, the, the fact that everyone has one now. Like, at once, will, will everybody be 3D scanning their homes one day to take a tour of it for their friends and relatives who can't get over here because of COVID? What's that going to be like? How do you understand spatial uh, experiences? And I think that to me is the next thing is actually improvement in the user experience rather than necessarily technology. And then I think the investment in the flow in the technology is an excellent point. And I think um, I might ask Daniel real quick to jump in and just talk to the what underpins the Show Your Archive, particularly the spatial archive of the Show Your Archive, is technology, uh, WebGL technology, which I understand Daniel is foundational to the metaverse. Yeah, um, so I'm sure everyone's heard of um, Facebook spoof to meta. Um, but the idea of the metaverse is really um, beyond digitizing, uh, I guess, the physical environment so, so that we can uplift not only ourselves, but um, the world around us. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think. The uh, virtual archive that we've created for the, the website <clears throat> um, really represents the shift towards, I guess, um, interactivity for both uh, users um, that I, I guess would have never had access to this kind of um, projects before, but also um, exposure as well. And I think um, with the shift towards, uh, again, Digital, digitally uplifting ourselves, um, I, I, I feel like there will be a, um, a shift towards uh, more digital uplift of spaces, buildings, um, virtual uh, environments, um, and yeah, definitely um, moving towards, I guess, this, uh, this focal area is, is uh, yeah, really, really crucial in, in developing both the technology for I guess the infrastructure, um, not only for communication, but um, for uh, archiving and um, uh, digitally storing, uh, I guess, um, existing buildings as well. So. Yeah, it feels like it's a long time coming, though. I don't know about you guys, like, we've been hearing about the virtual reality or the virtual reality and the reality extended, you know, for 20, 30 years now. Um, and. Gartner's hype cycle tells us that we get this peak of what is it, um, enlightenment, and then the trough of disillusion. And where are we now on that hype so, cycle? So, so I, I think um, I'm not sure if all of you remember there was a there was a video game called Second Life, um, and that was ahead of its time, really. Um, and and so I think because of the technology and the infrastructure existing in the day when Second Life came, uh, it was just not fundamentally possible for users to actually interact online. But now, I, I think um, everyone having access to a, a smartphone, like Kate said, um, allows you know uh, billions and billions of people to communicate and experience the world in a virtual sense. Um, and yeah, th there's definitely going to be a massive shift towards that in the coming years. 
Um, so yeah, and, and, and that has huge spatial implications as well for our, our cities. You know, if we were one of the, I mean, COVID's been a terrible thing, but one of the things I think that a lot of us have noticed is that it's how amazing the city is without any cars and reclaiming our own local communities, being able to just work from home, go to our local sandwich place or whatever, and you know, rather than be commuting for what one hour or, or more um, and going into a, you know. A, a, a very controlled space of the office where um, hopefully that's, you know, I don't know, a lot of people are predicting that like, we won't go back to a business as usual, for sure. Yeah. They're back. They're back. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to turn uh, in slightly different direction here. Um, earlier in um, Dr. Kelly Greenock's presentation, she mentioned this idea of degradation and decay. And I just wondered if the panel members could talk a little bit about the role of weathering in the urban and built environment and how, you know, we're interested in preserving things, but um, what's, the, what's the role of things degrading and expressing time? Yeah, it, it's amazing. Just you know, g going back to where I grew up, the old farm, all the old buildings. You know, the timbers just disappearing, and the, just in my lifetime to see these things that I thought were hard physical objects are just sort of you know disappearing or changing to, to really challenge my memories of them. Um, and that's, but, but then on the other side, I mean, you look at what, one of the things I've liked about doing the LIDAR work is the, its ability to pick up the context, the site context. And so you've got all the vegetation there as well, and that changes. And designers like um, Edna Walling would really, you know, do their landscaping to, to project decades into the future and, and the, grow into the house and vice versa, you know. And uh, so I think there's, um, uh, it happens, and um, the virtual technologies are good ways to, to mediate that, I think, and um, or to capture snapshots in time. You capture too much. Uh, that's a big. That's the big issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's it's uh, not about. It's just about your your attention now. I mean, some, what, what do you focus on? You know, what's the signal to noise ratio? You know, discoverability. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, absolutely. When you say building decay, I feel like I'm um, need to step up because I've been talking about this um, um, contemporary buildings by award-winning architects uh, aging prematurely. Um, and um, when I uh, when you talk about weathering, it seems to me that it's 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 a part or is something that is not embraced enough, and often. I would say also in, um, in the educational point of view, maintenance, it's not something that we teach uh, often. And um, you can you can see, I don't know, like one of the buildings I, I, I analyze, it's the Ponju Opera House. I'm sorry for my Chinese pronunciation, it's horrible, but it's, you cannot buy it designed by Zaha Hadid and you are not able to find a teacher uh, published in, uh, you know, architecture magazine that is not retouched. Um, because the image, the iconic power of that specific uh, architecture, it's uh, it's um, definitely more important to embrace the way the building is aging um, terribly. Um, aging. Uh, exactly, exa exa exactly. And so that's you know when you don't embrace aging, decay, entropy. In, uh, in that kind of time frame, and when you don't design with that in mind, it's uh, often some clashes or some interesting things that we can learn from happen. One quick comment um, at the time, I find it reassuring that buildings decay. Uh, I used to live up in Darwin, and the rate of organic growth would be, you know, if you left. Out something outside, but the next day there'd be like a half inch of like mold on it. Nature just takes over, and I found that really reassuring. Because sometimes when you live right in the city, it feels like 
the man-made environment is so dominant and the only thing we worry about in terms of sustainability, I actually find it reassuring that buildings decay and nature has a voice and, and lets things go back to the earth. Not necessarily a good thing in concrete, but in other materials, there is that opportunity to consider how long do we need to have a building for? Maybe we do don't need that building. Maybe it's not fit for purpose anymore, and maybe we should recycle all the materials and build something that suits our current lifestyle. Not a very appropriate comment in the context of archiving. I understand that, but but I'm there. <laughs> And those ideas come through in Shoyo's work. I mean, he was influenced by um, that, the general ideas in the 60s and 70s of these notions of impermanence and mobility and dynamism that Alan Gard was, was talking about. The dental clinic, when you read um, what's been written about it, is talked about as a UFO that arrives on the site. So the idea is it's never really permanently there. It's just going to, it's meant to look like it's going to lift off and take away. Uh, because it's acknowledging that it is an imposition on the site as opposed to something organic and, and of the site. And so certainly in the Kinoshita clinic, I should say, um, those ideas I feel are definitely um, at play there in terms of impermanence. And, and, you know, someone like Cedric Price who talked about actually planned obsolescence of buildings and intended for his buildings quite deliberately uh, to be deconstructed, um, you know, picked a date in 2020, and some of them haven't been um, against his wishes. Yeah. Mm. One thing I, that, that really strikes me is, is that, that it was a very time-based um, design process. So as I understand, in the post-war period in Japan, there a lot of the timber plantations had gone um, out of maintenance and you had a lot of really small timber that was kind of useless for traditional milling, you know, commercial timber. And so he's all, all got small section timber that's um, been, as I understand, what I've, it, it, it's, um, it was perhaps built green or semi-seasoned and each of them have a little split where the, it's around the heartwood. It's, it, it happens with every log if you just you know, let it go without milling it. And um, so this entire structure is built out of all salvaged, right. you know, it was sort of feral timber, you know. Like, yeah. mm. um, again, in the interview, Shoyo talked about a deep sense of responsibility to the community in terms of bringing down the forest community to use that material. And so he sought to find a very, you know, a, a way um, technology driven or innovation driven way to use that material in the best kind of structure. Mm. Yeah. As much as we're looking back at him, he was looking forward at us, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to um, bring it back to perhaps one last question. Um, maybe two. <laughs> I always talk too much. And this probably is one directed at you, Jack. What's the role of the digital twin? Ah, digital twin. Well, that's well. In digital preservation, architecture. Yeah, that's what I, I haven't seen enough of this yet. But I, I, I like the idea of building up longitudinal data sets for analysis. You know, and so to be able to to get those points in time and to get better information on how buildings age and how um, these things occur over time. Right now, we really just you know, having to sift through a lot of quantity to, to get get the to get that signal from the, the noise, you know. So um, digital twins are it's certainly a buzzword. It's a great great emerging technology, a bit like the, the metaverse, you know, and um, but it's um, technically possible just recently with the Internet of Things and um, a good a good base of standardization. So now we can use our imaginations a bit and um, you know, play with the technology, I think. So that leads me into the, the I think perhaps where we'll um, conclude and have some drinks before the big exciting it feels like me to it. Like, <laughs> well, well, this is a countdown. There's a countdown, isn't there, Danny? There's a countdown on the website. So when it goes live, up and up. Um, but yeah, we should we should have a small break before then. So my last question really is around 
what the panel um, thinks are the key challenges going forward um, with uh, the use of emerging and advanced um, digital technologies in the cultural heritage domain. Uh, my challenges and opportunities and sustainability for me and, and the environmental implications and how we do it, I think, to me, it should increasingly just be the work time aspect. So um, I'm going to hand it over to you, but that, that to me is a real issue that we need to consider in every element of what we do now. <laughs> I agree. Um, I feel like there is so much potential and uh, in terms of the opportunities just to be able to understand, for instance, what we have before demolishing it and repurposing. Um, I've worked in Italy with many engineers and architects that decided to demolish buildings without realizing that what they needed was already there. Um, so I feel like that in terms of sustainability and especially reusing, repurposing what we have, I think that's definitely a good uh, opportunity, uh, challenge could be founding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, well and um, environmental sustainability, but also um, so economic sustainability is something that, you know, I think will take care of itself, but then social sustainability. Um, I, I do like the social side of these these buildings. The spaces were so active, and, and I'm sure there might be a few exclusive places, but we don't want to be concentrating more resources and wealth into just a privileged few. I mean, we have to have a rich, diverse communities, d dense, increasingly dense and diverse. Um, I guess and good good design, density. yeah. yeah. Density, diversity, and design, yeah. Daniel. Um, I think one of the main challenges probably be um, data ownership. Um, and I think, uh, I guess, you know, who, who and what and why uh, data ownership um, in terms of archiving, not just buildings, but uh, I guess, you know, um, again, moving into the metaverse and, and digital space, um, I guess the the data ownership that we all need to kind of struggle and kind of uh, like, do we own our data or do the corporations own our data? You know, if we're creating um, these archives, are we the custodians of these data? Um, are we supposed to, you know, openly kind of share this data or do we keep it behind closed doors? And, and I think um, in terms of communication, education um, and research, it's, it's going to be a challenge to kind of navigate that area of data ownership, so yeah. Yeah, and again that brings us right back to the keynote talk from today from Dr. Pellegrino, who talked about uh, data management and um, brought up this idea that, that the kind of digital data that we're collecting about these buildings now could very well become archaeological. Um, we could have, you know, we don't know uh, you know, it's all stored in the cloud. How do we continue to access that? Who manages it? And we actually need to talk about who's going to manage it. These are really big issues that people often forget with um, technology, with digital technology, that it's great to get the website up and running, it's great to have some data and some calendars to come up with and keep it going and keep it in mind. It's too much for me to think so I think there's a real, um, and this is what Greg Lynn was thinking about when he wrote the Archaeology of the Digital uh, and put on the exhibition as part of the, um, with the Canadian Centre for Architecture. He well recognised that all of the digital work that the architects, pioneering architects in, in the 1980s, um, had uh, undertaken were on floppy disks and were lost and, you know, were just very, very precious um, things in the end, and you would never have thought of that, right, when you used to have a million floppy disks, and this is revealing my age, in your bag at uni, and you just chucked them around and whatever, and yet, yeah, um, I think of all my uni projects, they're gone, they're gone forever, yeah, so I think going forward, data management is something we need to give a bit more attention to. So with that, I will um, close the panel uh, discussion, and thank you so much, that was such a great conversation. Um,
So thank you to all the panelists, and we'll have a little break, and, and then we'll do our New Year's Eve countdown um, at around, I think, 8 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. <laughs>